so uh, after discussing about the different instruments of the monetary policy and as well as the operating procedure of the monetary policy of the reserve bank of india so today uh, we will be discussing about what are those challenges and the reforms which have taken place in monetary policy framework in the indian context and as well as another concept we will be discussing which is called the central bank autonomy which is a very debatable issue uh, nowadays which is uh, people are very much concerned about so let us see uh, what are those challenges uh, we always face or the reserve bank of india always faces whenever they are implementing the monetary policy the first challenge basically they face because there is a integration in the global economic system every markets are highly integrated both domestically and as well as internationally in that particular context the price is basically highly fluctuating asset prices stock price uh, the instrument which are available in other markets which are very much uh, highly fluctuating if they are highly fluctuating in that particular context what is happening it is very difficult to forecast the price in such a way by that the policy implementation should be done to control the price level so in this context the managing liquidity uh, in greater man liquidity management with special focus on short end of the market spectrum is basically very important but that may not be possible at any point of time because of the volatility of the asset prices there is also considerably difficulties faced by the monetary authorities in detecting and measuring the inflation how the inflation can be measured particularly this inflation expectations uh, why basically it happens because we have the different measure we have wpi we have cpi and again wpi there are different components cpi we have different components which should be actual reflection of the pricing which particular index should be considered for measuring the inflation that is basically the another issue always the reserve bank of india thinks and they cannot also predict the money supply because there is a volatile increasing capital flows relative to domestic absorptive capacity the absorption capacity of the domestic market uh, whatever we have that sometimes is also in comparison to the increasing capital flows to the system in terms of fii or fdi sometimes it is very difficult to predict or to expect that how the price is going to be or how the money supply is going to be in the next period so the uh, actual corridor or actual money supply whatever is the intermediate target the rbi has that may not be followed so that is basically another question in the emerging scenario there is a large and uncertain capital flows the choice of the instrument of the sterilization and other policy responses have been constant you know whenever we will discuss more on the about sterilized policy and non sterilized policy whenever we talk about the reserve bank's intervention in terms of the uh, your exchange rate and as well as the money supply but here whatever uh, way basically the foreign capital flows are coming to india or whatever fluctuations they have realized in terms of that capital flows that basically is creating difficulty for the reserve bank of india to devise a certain domestic policy which can control the money supply in such a way by that the price can be stable as well as the growth can also be uh, increasing in this particular point of time or that particular point of time and uh, another point is in the liberalization process aligning the operations of the large financial conglomerates and foreign institutions with local public policy priorities remains a challenge for the domestic financial regulators there is a increasing mnc's the parent company is somewhere in us or some other countries and their operations are in india and their operations the objective of those companies and the objective of the uh, the uh, public policy priorities within that hosting country sometimes differ so the money which is circulated through that kind of transactions that also sometimes may create the uh, problem for the public policies uh, uh, in that particular hosting country so whatever actual process of the monetary policy should be adopted by rbi 
or by the reserve bank or uh, by the central bank that also creates sometimes the challenge uh, for them. The dominance of all being financial intermediaries increases the concentration risk. Because you see uh, if there is a dominance of uh, big financial intermediaries, they can also regulate the price. If the price is not very competitive in that, that sense what is happening, the concentration risk in the market may also increase, which also creates the problem to devise a proper monetary policy for them. So, these are uh, more or less the different challenges what this uh, Reserve Bank of India face whenever they uh, devise this monetary policy or implement this monetary policy in this particular country. So, keeping those things in the mind uh, way back in 19, uh, 2014, uh, not 19, it is 2014, there was a committee which was established and this uh, committee was headed by the uh, current governor uh, uh, Urjit Patel. Uh, Mr. Urjit Patel was the governor of that, uh, was the chairman of that particular committee, that time he was the deputy governor. And that committee has recommended certain things uh, to revise the monetary policy framework for the Indian context. Then how this revised framework basically looks like, we have summarized that particular report in this case, we, we just discuss certain major issues or major points which has been highlighted in that report. So, the first of all, uh, the first uh, thing what this particular policy or policy uh, revised document has said or the recommendations uh, have said, the inflation should be nominal anchor for the monetary policy framework. More or less, instead of a multiple objective, they are going towards a single objective. Previously, we have what is happening? We have to control the price, the price stability should be controlled or price should be stable or the increase volatility of the price should be controlled or the inflation should be controlled in the general sense. And as well as the growth rate of the GDP also should increase. So, that is a multiple indicator approach the central bank was following. But now what is happening? This uh, objective of the monetary policy is going towards a single objective function. Mostly they are concentrating on controlling the inflation. Because the argument is if the price is becoming stable, or price becomes stable, then growth can take place. So, that is the uh, basic notion or basic intuition of the revising the monetary policy framework in the Indian context. So, therefore, the what they said the inflation should be nominal anchor for the monetary policy framework and they have taken CPI or consumer price index as the measure of the nominal anchor for the policy communication. Previously, there was a debate confusion was whether they should go for WPI wholesale price index or CPI, but they have said that CPI should be used and here they have constructed a new CPI index which basically covers of more commodities which are really in the true sense is used as a necessity commodities or necessary products in the day to day life. So, CPI has been used as uh, CPI has been used as the indicator for measuring the price in the Indian market. This is the first uh, uh, kind of uh, recommendation what they, whatever they have given. And already I told you that uh, they are going towards the inflation targeting. So, because of that they are targeting the inflation of 4 percent with a band of 2 percent plus or minus around it. So, there is a model whatever they have formulated. And using that model, what they are trying to say, if either if the inflation is 4 percent, then the growth rate can be achieved, a particular amount of growth rate can be achieved or if the inflation will deviate by 2 percent, either it can become 2 percent or it can become 6 percent. That also should not hamper the, uh, the expected growth rate what the economy is trying to achieve. So, the inflation target means that should be 4 percent in the Indian context plus or minus 2 percent and for that we have the contingency plans or the monetary policy has made the contingency plans that this is the way this particular thing will work out. Then monetary policy decision making should be vested in a monetary policy committee that be a separate monetary policy committee should be established and the monetary policy committee uh, is basically governed by uh, certain bodies and here governor of RBI will be the chairman, deputy governor in charge of monetary policy will be the vice chairman. 
and the executive director in charge of monetary policy will be a member and two other members will be the external basically who are the experts in the monetary policy. In the macroeconomics monetary policy experts who are the external they are not a part of RBI, but they are the members and from day, time to time they will devise that how the monetary policy should look like and what are those uh, way basically the system should work. Then we have uh, if you see what are the other recommendations they have given? The other recommendation they have given that the weighted average call money rate should remain the operating target and the overnight repo rate liquidity adjustment facility repo rate will continue as the single policy rate. Previously, if you if you have remembered the either repo rate and reverse rep, repo rate was changing by RBI, but nowadays you might have observed RBI is only changing the repo rate because the reverse repo rate, the marginal standing facility rate and everything are basically linked to repo rate. If repo rate will change automatically reverse repo rate will be 0.25 basis uh, 0.25 percent less than repo rate and MSF rate will be 0.25 percent above the repo rate. So, repo rate is used as a single policy rate. So, here if they will change the repo rate, if the repo rate will change our, our target, target rate is the call money rate. So, repo rate will have the impact upon the call money rate, weighted average of the call money rate. If the call money rate will change, then it will have the impact upon the market rate. So, already I told you in the previous class that the their target is their intermediate target is the call money rate, that means the target rate is the call money rate. If the call money rate is below the standing facility rate, then the amount of money supply, whatever the survey has predicted, that can be maintained in the system at that particular point of time. So, the that that is why this is called the operating target. Uh, then provision of liquidity by RBI at the overnight repo rate will however, be restricted to specified ratio of bank wise net demand and timeline. How much money the commercial banks can borrow from RBI through repo operations that also will be certain percentage of the total deposit base whatever they have that has been fixed by Reserve Bank of India. That means, the unlimited amount of money cannot be borrowed by commercial bank from RBI whenever they require. Then uh, they support this operating framework, the committee recommends uh, that some new instrument can be added that is basically called the term repo rate, because this repo rate which was working now which is basically the overnight rate. So, the, uh, they have also recommended we should have a term repo rate, if any bank wants to borrow the money little bit for longer period of time then for that also this different interest rate should be determined or different kind of uh, policy debt should be determined and by that maybe some time can be given to that uh, particular bank to repay that particular money to the uh, central bank or the reserve bank. So, that is uh, another recommendation, but uh, this recommendation also uh, is considered to devise the new policy framework for the monetary policy. Then we have another uh, recommendation they have consistent with the time path of fiscal consideration mentioned SLR should be reduced to a level in, con in consensus with the requirement of the liquidity coverage ratio. That means, they said this statutory liquidity ratio, the statutory liquidity ratio whatever we have that basically should be reduced to a level in accordance with the liquidity coverage ratio of the Bessel 3 norms. The liquidity coverage ratio is a ratio which is basically measured uh, or used to measure the liquidity of the commercial bank. So, the liquidity coverage ratio and SLR should go together by that the uh, if the liquidity ratio is maintained or the liquidity coverage ratio is maintained then what is happening that that automatically takes care of the uh, investment in the government securities and different kind of liquid instruments whatever we have. Then another uh, uh, revision they basically recommended that open market operations have to be detached from fiscal operations instead links only to the liquidity management. Uh, to control or to fulfill the gap of the government uh, financing the uh, open market operations were using to finance this kind of deficits by the government sometimes open market operations were used as an instrument. But what RBI has recommended let us detach, uh, detach that open market operation from the fiscal operations part, open market operations should be totally related to 
the control the liquidity in the market. There should not be any kind of link between the open market operations and the fiscal policy or fiscal operation of the uh, government. It should be directly linked to the liquidity management or the change uh, control the money supply in the system. That is why the, the open market operations should be totally a monetary policy instrument not are the instrument to also uh, take care of the fiscal consolidation of the government and a proper sterilized policy for foreign exchange reserves. The foreign exchange already I told you sterilized policy means whenever there is a change in uh, uh, money supply for the buying and selling of the uh, foreign uh, securities or foreign currencies. So, in that particular point of time this may affect the total money supply in the system. So, in, in that particular context what RBI does they take the reverse position in the domestic economy. For example, they are buying more dollar if they are buying more dollar in the domestic economy the, uh, this particular uh, domestic uh, in the foreign assets demand for foreign assets should be there. So, because of that the total money supply may get changed and that particular point of time they make certain kind of policies they take certain kind of steps by that the domestic money supply will go down. If the domestic money supply will go down and the foreign money has been injected into the system the net effect on the money supply will be 0. Anyway that is called the sterilized intervention that we will discuss more, but this is the way the sterilized policy for foreign exchange reserves should be uh, properly utilized by that it will not basically affect adversely the price stability in the economic system. So, these are the different recommendations whatever they have uh, they have given and over the period of time these recommendations have been incorporated uh, in the uh, monetary policy framework of the RBI. Uh, if you see this one I have just given a glimpse of the what do we mean by the inflation targeting. Uh, here uh, the inflation targeting means that this monetary policy committee is empowered and responsible to set up the benchmark policy rate that is repo rate in such a way that uh, the inflation can be kept within a certain limit. Then uh, here the inflation target always can be maintained and it can be changed in every 5 years. So, that is basically depends upon the consumer price index. And here what basically here uh, the central government of India has fixed the inflation target for the period beginning from August 2016 and ending on the March 31st 2021. So, this is the target now whatever is working now that is uh, inflation target is 4 percent upper tolerance limit is 6 percent lower tolerance limit is 2 percent that already I told you. The key advantage of a range around a target is that it allows the monetary policy committee to recognize the short run trade off between inflation and growth, but enables it to pursue the inflation target in the long run over the course of the business cycle. So, what is the condition for a failed monetary policy with respect to the set target? As per the policy if inflation goes above 6 percent or goes below 2 percent for 3 consecutive quarters, then it will be treated as the failure of the RBI's monetary policy. In such a scenario, the RBI will initiate counteractive measures to meet the required target. If it is fluctuated within that 2 percent, then no action will be taken for that. Uh, if the uh, what the RBI should do if inflation target is not met, then the new notification also prescribes the procedure to be followed by RBI if the target is missed. Where RBI fails to meet the inflation target, it is uh, it shall sell out. It, it shall set out a report to the central government stating the reason for failure to achieve the inflation target, remedial actions uh, proposed to be taken by RBI and an estimate of the time period within which the inflation target shall be achieved pursuant to the timely implementation of the proposed remedial actions. So, those kind of uh, actions will be taken if the inflation target is not met. If it is met, it is fine. If it does not met, then those kind of uh, uh, things or those kind of uh, actions should be taken by the uh, Reserve Bank of India with respect to the government of India. So, this is called basically the or features of the inflation targeting what we can say and up to 2021 this particular target will work. And up to 2021 one revised target can be created and accordingly one range also can be created like upper tolerance limit and the lower tolerance limit. So, this is about uh, the different uh, kind of instrument challenges and revisions 
of the monetary policy. Then we can move to another important issue which is called the central bank autonomy. Uh, some days back you might have read in the newspaper that uh, one of the central bank deputy governors Viral Acharya had said that more autonomy should be given. Before that also the other governors, deputy governors have pleaded for the autonomy. And uh, in that context obviously the question can arise what do we mean by the autonomy? How the autonomy is defined and whether the autonomy is good or bad from the central bank perspective and from the public perspective. So, in this context if you see in general sense the autonomy is or the independence is related to three areas. One is personal matters, financial aspects and conduct of the policy. These are the three things always comes whenever it, is, it can be related to personal issues, financial issues and policy issues. These are the three issues through which the autonomy can be defined or autonomy can be examined. What do you mean by the personal independence? The personal independence means to what extent the government distances itself from the appointment, term of office, dismissal, uh, uh, dismissal procedures of top central bank officials and the governing board. It also includes the extent of and nature of representation of the government in the governing body of the central bank. Who appoints governor? Central bank. Who appoints deputy governor? Central bank. So, all those top bodies are basically appointed by the government. And again in the central board of directors we have the more uh, there are many government bodies or government representatives who basically work on behalf of the government. So, in that context in what level up to what level the policy decisions or particular appointments which are taken for the reserve bank of India are free from any kind of government interventions. So, one is your personal matter. Uh, in the personal point of view that how far the particular reserve bank or particular central bank is autonomous that is first point. Whenever we talk about the financial independence, the financial independence basically relates to the freedom of the central bank to decide the extent to which government expenditure is directly or indirectly financed by the central bank. Previously what was happened if there is kind of deficit by the financing deficit by the government then it has to be financed by the issuance of the treasury bills. The reserve bank of India will automatically issue the treasury bills to overcome or to fulfill the deficit what the government has. That is called the automatic monetization of the financing the deficits. There is no need to do anything there is no uh, there is no such kind of uh, it is mandatory by the RBI to do that, but this has been discontinued since 1997. To some extent this Reserve Bank of India has got the financial autonomy that means to fulfill the financing deficit Reserve Bank of India is not mandate it is not mandatory for the Reserve Bank of India or the Reserve Bank of India is not bound to do that whenever there is a deficit uh, in the system. So, financial autonomy to some extent uh, we have. So, direct or automatic access of government to central bank credit would naturally imply that monetary policy is subordinated to the fiscal policy. So, this is what basically what we can see that whenever there is a uh, if automatically some financing deficit is taken place then we can say that fiscal policy dominating over the monetary policy and to fulfill that financing deficit RBI has to do some kind of uh, decision. So, some has to take certain kind of decision by that the deficit can be covered up. Finally, the policy independence is related to the flexibility given to the central bank in the formulation and execution of the monetary policy. Government or finance ministry should not interfere for the formulation or, uh, or the use of instruments for the monetary policy by the reserve bank. What instrument the reserve bank is of India is interested to use, whether they want to increase the interest rate or they want to decrease the interest rate, those kind of uh, interference from the government side should not be there. If from the government side the interference uh, will be there then we can say the autonomy is less. If the interference is less then we can say that autonomy is more. So, in that context the three types of autonomy is defined. Then we can see that uh, uh, why basically we are in uh, uh, support of autonomy, what are those advantages of the autonomy. If autonomy will be given then what is the uh, merits. 
There are three uh, things we discuss in this contest. One is time inconsistency theory, theory of political business cycle and theory of public choice. You see, if there is a conservative uh, central banker is there, then they will always look for something by that the price can be stable and inflation can be controlled. But sometimes what has happened, there is a contract between the, uh, if there is no such kind of autonomy, I mean the, there sometimes the Reserve Bank of India governor will be appointed or any central bank governor will be appointed and there is optimal contract between this government and this governor and they will act on their own benefits or the uh, particular political system or political parties can work or the government can work in such a way that uh, it to some extent maximize the social welfare, but it also help this uh, government or and as well as the uh, public in such a way that may be this uh, total control will not be there in terms of the price stability or the output increase. So, that means there is a trade off between the uh, there is some kind of contract contract between the governor and the uh, in the and this uh, government and by that any decisions which are taken that may not be in the public interest. But if this there is autonomy then the governor can take their own decisions by that it may be with a special interest which is driven by the economic factors. And another one is there is a uh, theory of political business cycle which tells that whenever any new election takes place this incumbent policy makers uh, who basically they do or the incumbent party which comes to the power they take certain decisions which are very much relaxed, uh, relaxed decisions which may deviate from the actual uh, uh, kind of target whatever the central bank has. So, that, that may destabilize the price and all these things and whenever they were going towards the uh, end of this uh, period or their uh, term is going to be over, maybe some decisions will be taken which is uh, uh, maybe uh, the friendly towards the public and uh, it may be a populist policy which can create some kind of economic disturbances. So, in that particular point of time what happened in the beginning may be policies were good, but after the period over the periods whenever this uh, term is going to be over they take certain policies which is beneficial for them, but may not be beneficial for the public. So, uh, so in that particular point of time what happens in the long run that may affect the economic system adversely. So, if the governor is independent or the autonomy is given more then may be the monetary policy part will be taken in such a way that those kind of problem may not arise. And central bank basically theory of public choice states that central banks as an effective institutional constant to control the inflation and increase the output because they have the expertise. But there are some limitations of the autonomy because it lacks the democratic legitimacy because government is chosen by the public. So, any decision which is taken by the government we should ensure that that is in for the interest of the public. But here if everything is totally driven by only the economic factors uh, or by theoretical factors may be that uh, lacks the democratic legitimacy. It may also lead to frictions between fiscal and the monetary authorities and that will basically uh, will be costly uh, for the participants in the market and as well as for the society. Because the government and the uh, reserve bank or the central bank if they do not go together that will also create the problem for the society at a large. So, there may be a significant divergence in the preference pattern of independent central banks in society at a large because society needs something else, but uh, in terms of uh, uh, functioning point of view the Reserve Bank of India or the any central bank wants something else that creates the divergence in terms of their choices and that also creates the problem the may create the problem in the economic system. So, these are the different limitations of the autonomy that also always we see. So, the, uh, there are indexes which are available to measure the autonomy for the central banks. So, autonomy as measured from two angles one is political autonomy and economic autonomy or political independence and economic independence. So, if you see there are ranks have been given and uh, this is an index which is created for all over the world to the different uh, uh, central banks and India has scored 0 point it varies from 1 to uh, basically it is in the percentage basis, uh, it can maximum go to 1, 0 to 1. So, India has scored 0 0.25 for political autonomy of the central bank as against the average score of 0 0.56 for the group of emerging markets. That means, we do not have any political autonomy or our political autonomy is very less 
in comparison to the other emerging economies which are existing in India. But they have scored 0 0.75 for the economic autonomy of the central bank which is the same as the average score of that group. That means, in terms of economic autonomy like financial autonomy because there is a removal of autom automatic monetization of the financing deficit etcetera etcetera. We have some economic autonomy or the financial autonomy, but political autonomy in terms of appointment, in terms of uh, the uh, implementation of the policy and all these things are relatively less. Less autonomy in terms of the personal matter, but some degree of the financial autonomy that already I told you. So, in terms of uh, the measures, we are basically to some extent we are better off in terms of the financial autonomy, but whenever it is uh, political autonomy, we are basically lagging behind. Uh, please go through this particular uh, references uh, for this particular session. So, this is about the autonomy of the Reserve Bank of India and as well as Central Bank as a whole, it has both merits and demerits, but still it is a debatable issue and uh, this is basically the brief idea about that and we can explore more that whether the autonomy is good or bad for the Central Bank or for society at a large. Thank you very much.